I'm Carolyn Marvin. I'm a faculty member at the Annenberg School. Welcome to all of you from lunch and those of you that didn't have lunch but came anyway. Uh, and our panel today, I want to briefly uh, introduce the people and then each person is going to talk 15 or 20 minutes and then we'll have time for um, discussion. Okay, so um, just here is Elaine Ewan, who is an associate professor in the communication department at the University of Illinois at Chicago. And next to her is Anne-Marie Iddens, a doctoral candidate in the Department of Communication Studies at the University of Michigan. And on the very end is Pio Aurora, uh, who is in the Department of Media and Communication and on the Faculty of History, Culture and Communication at Erasmus University in Rotterdam. So, um, Pyle will yes. begin, yes. All right. All right, so hi, everyone. And uh, I can imagine you all awake and ready to go, right? Food shouldn't deter our attention. But either way, I will talk like this. So, um, so my paper actually is drawn from my a recently published book called The Leisure Commons, where I primarily argue that we need to reconceptualize today's internet as the geographies of leisure. So why leisure? Because in the, like, at this stage, the internet is mature enough that we have a tremendous amount of data to, anyway, we have a tremendous amount of data that prove that much of what we do online as users, not just in the West, but around the world, is primarily leisure oriented. So people are gaming, watching pornography, social network sites. And so these and basically for socializing purposes, entertainment. So that's our dominant practice. So really we need to put leisure at the central, uh, you know, defining characteristic of the internet. Why geographies, as you know, several presentations have uh, made it abundantly clear is that we cannot understand user behavior without emphasizing these architectures of participation, the politics of algorithms, right? So combined within these geographies of leisure, of course, multiple actions are embedded within it, which is politics, for instance, as we will be talking about, right? So the other aspect is the bridging of the urban and the digital commons. Um, you know, at this stage, nobody would seriously argue that there is an distinct offline space and an online space. Yet what I find is that uh, in many studies, empirically, they continue to approach it that way, or they've reached a stage where you often talk about it as a blurring of boundaries, but it doesn't get pushed beyond that. So that's part of what my book does, is taking it and pushing that metaphor all the way, this relationship between the digital and the urban commons. So um, obviously the digital commons found its inspiration from the urban commons uh, rhetoric and discourse and for, you know, and rightly so, right? Because if you look, think back at the birth of the internet, um, you know, the very strong utopic rhetoric was used about it being open, free for all, um, democratic, uh, deeply public sphere. At last it could be the new public sphere that could you know, circumvent the chronic issues from the past public spheres. So it's interesting that if you go back into history uh, in the 19th century, there was another kind of public space that shared similar rhetoric, and that being the urban park. Um, in fact, it was a landmark achievement for society because this idea of demarcating a public space for nothing but leisure, social purposes for the masses was a phenomenally radical time for across societies, whether it was the imperial powers in China or the royalty in London or you know in the US. This was a pervasive trend, but prior to that, that did not exist as a concept. So this became a symbolic landscape signaling a new kind of e civility, a new era of modernity, and a sign of a more humane public, right? So the question is, that why haven't we capitalized 
uh, given on this urban commons literature, given that you know the internet, as a, as we know in terms of its history, is relatively short. So that is what I actually do in the book. Now, using metaphors as the urban commons is 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 not a new thing. In fact, it is impossible. One can actually, you know, categorically argue here that it is impossible to cognitively conceptualize the internet without the use of metaphor. And I've noticed in the morning to the early afternoon, people have been using metaphors across board. And, you know, if you think about whether to emphasize novelty with the wild, wild west, the utopic, like the, the frontier, new frontier, each of these had symbolic connotations, which would be interesting to track how it has changed to today's walled gardens, electronic ghettos, uh, you know, or the, the trying to capitalize on the globalization of it by talking about the scapes. So metaphors are here to stay and very much part of our, uh, shall we say, uh, research tools to shape our understandings of the internet. Now, I'd like you to sort of, you know, I know many of you are social media scholars, or communication scholars, just take a step back and just, you know, go into a very different kind of space, which is the park space. You know, disturbingly, I've become an expert on park studies, although I'd like to really clarify I, I'm not a park expert, but uh, it's something I need to purge now that I've written the book, so I'm, but after this presentation. So, um, yeah, but it's interesting because I, you know, like, for example, uh, of park studies, yes, there is a department called park studies, expert George McKay wrote Radical Gardening, a wonderful book, but listen to this paragraph, which she's talking about the very, the physicality and materiality of the urban park, and one can't help but see that as writing about the social media space. He says, from public park to garden city, there have been important moments when the garden in its most civic and municipal manifestations has been used by social movements as a site of struggle, opposition, and innovation. Sometimes it has been the very topic itself of those activities. These moments can be short-term, temporary, crisis-ridden, as in the aggressive riot in the park, or long-term and intended as permanent, as in the construction of the new green settlement. What is striking is the frequent idealism or utopianism experienced or expressed in the kind of urban public green, as though in some way the garden itself can function as a special zone for the common articulation of social change, social experimentation, and the critical rejection of some aspects of society, and even the confrontation with authority. So to me, you could easily you know, transplant that to what we're talking about today in the social media realm. Um, so let's look at a couple of examples here. The People's Park, Berkeley. Um, it was actually a park which was designed by the urban planners and the university to really create a sort of haven for recreation, entertainment, raise property values around Berkeley area, and for the appropriate public to inhabit. But the public didn't see it that way. In fact, definitely not the homeless. They totally took over the public park, and the hippies uh, did a number of sit-ins, and uh, soon it came to be known as a hippie park, where, and they saw it as an, an unconstrained space where they could actually voice their concerns on military, uh, being against militarism, you know, sexism, pollution, and all the other concerns in society that were pervasive at that time. So. Over because of these uh, constant mass rallies and protests that were occupying the space, Berkeley's People's Park became synonymous and symbolic of a protest park. People expected you to protest there. So um, this was obviously not the dream of the urban planners. And what's interesting is the people who protested there, it's, uh, many of them went on to shaping Silicon Valley as it is today. And, uh, took what was called the Californian ideology, which is very much shaped in the sort of public greens, to the, um, you know, IT industry, which uh, propagated open source, uh, you know, systems and shared economies, and with this belief that that is how the internet should be. So here is a very clear-cut example of how the digital and the urban commons really relate where an ideology pervades across realms, right? Another, let's go to Hyde Park. Um, so if you go back in time, uh, in the 1800s, uh, there was um, uh, basically 
when people were dying, like the criminals, they were given a last chance by the royalty to give their last dying speeches. And it was called the Speaker's Corner. Um, at that time, you know, the royalty believed there needed to be a safety valve for society, otherwise there would be mass unrest, particularly because of the urbanization mm -hmm. at that time, uh, which was exponentially growing and bringing in immigrants and putting a lot of pressure on the city. So um, the speaker's corner became sort of expanded over time to just express any kind of public issue. It could be grievances on congestion, you know, pollution, similar as what we were talking about in People's Park. And the royalty allowed that because they knew the functioning role of that safety valve. However, Hyde Park, where the Speaker's Corner is situated, continued to be a royal space. It was a royal park, which was really, it was even designed in that way to make people feel uh, inferior, like to f very distinctly about classes. And the, the architects of the park said, we want the bourgeois fantasies to pervade into the public space and for the masses to really like yearn and have aspirations of mobility. And so this was the rise of capitalism at that time and it was very well supported. But there was a tipping point as we were talking about in the morning is to pay attention to when are the, what, you know, what are the tipping points of a culture when <coughs> a public space or a space per se transforms into a different kind of symbolic space. And it was basically a Sunday trading bill which was passed which said that the royalty said you cannot do any trading of fish and meat on Sundays. Now, it wasn't particularly that bill that was so shocking, but it was accumulation of events and the speaker's corners, grievances that, that led to this sort of outburst saying that, no, that's not possible. So that created mass activism that lasted for a long time to a point where Hyde Park and speaker's corner became the powerful symbol of protest and mass movement. So, and ha continues to this date, to a point that Speaker's Corner has become a metaphor for any kind of protest movements around the world. A good, uh, I was very happy to hear Radha's presentation of the Jantar Mantar, where the, I mean, for those who weren't there in the morning, it was where the gang rape in Delhi, uh, and there was a mass protest uh, on that. And um, one of the locations they actually uh, came together was this place called Jantar Mantar, and in the media, they said, this is our speaker's corner. India has multiple speaker's corners, and this is our speaker's corner. And that's interesting. And uh, there's also, in Egypt, during uh, you know the uprisings, people said, at last we have our speaker's corner uh, in our Twitter, in our you know protest movements. And so speaker's corner also has gone digital and has a sort of global, you know, um, uh, protest group, which I find very fascinating. So here you have a discourse that has pervaded across board and has sort of decontextualized from the British Hyde Park context, right? Um, and an example on, say, shifting gears to the Beijing Park, like, so let's take China, for example, in the 19th century, one of the things we, we often believe when we look at protest movements is as if a lot of the protest has, comes from bottom up, and the pressure continues up to a point where the authority, you know, uh, breaks down. But actually, that wasn't this, uh, the case in multiple societies, including Beijing, because at that time they were transitioning from the imperial to the state system and the modern state, and they wanted to signal modernity. So, in fact, urban parks became a concerted action on their part to say, listen, we have arrived, we are modern, and we are going to civilize our masses. There was a lot of paternalism saying that we will take care and socialize the masses in ways that is going to be deemed respectable, and we're going to get the right kind of citizenry. So they uh, situated libraries and parks. They had uh, major campaigns within parks for literacy, for health care, and a number of other uh, you know, uh, efforts at socializing and creating sort of more right kind of moral behavior. Of course, to their surprise, uh, the public used the very same spaces for, you know, pro-democratic rallies, even at that time, right? And so it's interesting if you look at, you know, as uh, Gobin and a number of people, and Elaine will be talking later, and men, is that 
there's a lot of uh, examples of how people have used different blog spaces, internet spaces to express themselves. But um, th this is very similar with what is happening in China. China didn't block the internet. What they, they did support and they created a sort of a, you know, walled garden in a sense, saying that we will support it. and they have a lot, number of e-government platforms where they encourage users to participate. And of course, the participation is far lower for a number of reasons. But there's strong parallels with the way they approach the internet to even historically how the Beijing Park was approached. Um, and so shifting gears now is another aspect that I would like to emphasize is, and actually uh, we have had some very good conversations in the morning which have given so many wonderful examples on this, is the creative and playful protest uh, element to this is you can't mobilize people without being creative and without, uh, you know, inspiring them in some way. And humor, creativity, entertainment are often very powerful tools to get people on board, the way you phrase something. So that itself, there is a template, shall we say, of participation that needs to be recognized. For example, the Raging Grannies as an example. At the, you know, Chernobyl disaster in Ukraine, um, a number of women thought, okay, we need to get attention on this cause and what it's doing. So let's take something that, you know, a, a template of uh, a stereotype that people don't really feel um, threatened by is old grannies. And let's play it up because, of course, there's a lot of authority and pressure. So they, dress, they pushed that metaphor to a point they had these flamboyant hats gaudy shawls, uh, frilly, you know, aprons, and they had little handbags, and they all dressed as grannies, and they raged on about social issues. And that really caught the media attention, but it also made the state rather uncomfortable to persecute these old grannies. So they would look far more ludicrous versus if they were just regular people. So it, it put them in that very weird sort of zone and kept them, uh, you know, at an arm distance. And this has template, has become a very powerful template. They're circulated all over the world. They're right now six, 70 outfits around the world, from Japan, Germany, to Korea, across board, using this um, to, you know, get very local issues, which may be a sort of a way into us talking, as Gobin brought up, about how do you talk about these local and global dimensions? How do we negotiate? And I would suggest, let's see what are the templates that are being circulated and which are emptied regardless of context, they can circulate. So this is one kind, right? Or speaker's corner is another. And then you populate and contextualize it with certain personal uh, local issues. So this is, of course, very much, you know, in tandem with the, you know, the lol cat, like uh, the uh, cute cat theory, where how can you shut down, an, you know, a, a site that promotes cute cats, and people, majority of people who are not really political, as Zuckerman talks about, uh, would be rather pissed off with the authority. So it puts the authority in a very uncomfortable situation. That is the biggest leverage that you can get. Um, and an, another uh, last example here is, going back to China, is how the public park was used. Sometimes it could be a much softer way of gaining attention. And uh, something very innocent and innocuous and seemingly non-political. For example, the, the Shigong, I may be butchering the pronunciation, but um, Shigong is a sort of breathing exercises that, was, that are conducted open in the public. Uh, in the Beijing Park, and it doesn't seem at all threatening, right? But it has a deep history to the Mao era, and it also goes into uh, a major association was used for peasant uprisings, because basically Qigong was about cultivating a private mental space in a public sphere, which really emphasized a sort of utopia of autonomy and individualism that was rather unique of that of its kind. So the state is very uncomfortable with this association of Qigong, but they can't really condemn it because technically these are breathing exercises. So people come together understanding the meaning and the symbolism of this exercise, that it's not just an exercise. And it's very hard to persecute thereby. Much like what's happening with the Chinese blogs, for example, one example is where 
moves in mind is, uh, you know, she talks about, she came out and explicit about her sexual life and she talks about sex. So it's not really actually political in that sense, but it became a platform for multiple other issues because she broke boundaries of saying and being different and carving a, a very personal space in a public sphere, which allowed people to, because after all, often politics is very personal. So to summarize, what is very important to remember is these, these templates of participation are pervasive across board, but it is important to rec recognize the historical dimensions of these and how it, sometimes they evolve, but sometimes they persist and bloom across different dimensions. And it is a useful way of looking at the digital and the urban commons as a landscape which shares these sort of symbolic architectures. So, yeah, I mean, if you want a copy of the book, since I don't care about the publishers, I'm happy to send you one <laughs> online through the PDF. You can just tweet me, and thank you. Okay, so Gobin says that we should have questions after every... Yeah, I, I think we should have all the questions. Okay, good, I do too. Good. <laughs> okay. And um, thank you, Kyle. And that was a perfect uh, paper to lead off because I forgot to say that, of course, our theme here is protests, parks, and digital geography. So, okay. So. Hi, my name is Anne Marie Eddins. Um, I just want to say thank you, first of all, to the organizing um, organizers, and see, I'm honored to be here um, with all these wonderful presenters. Um, I'm a doctoral candidate at um, the University of Michigan in the Department of Communication Studies. So the work I'm presenting today is entitled No Concessions, The Contentious Politics of Mampa Kinch's Militant Bloggers in Post-Arab Spring, Morocco. So in February of 2011, Moroccan protesters took to the streets en masse, joining a wave of collective uprisings throughout North Africa and the Middle East that became known as the Arab Spring. In Morocco, the protest movement became known as Le Mouvement de Bon Février, or M20, after the kingdom's largest day of protests that led King Mohammed VI, aka M. Cis, to promise a constitutional referendum. One of the slogans of the Moroccan protesters was Mafakinch, which means no concessions in Moroccan Arabic, in reference to the frequent co-optation of oppositional movements by the regime and frustration with the slow pace of democratic reform. So today I'll be discussing um, some preliminary research from a case study that's part of my dissertation, looking at a new politics of culture emerging in Morocco. First, I'll quickly sketch Mafa Kinch's origins um, as part of the Arab Spring before moving on to some theoretical conversations I see as central to understanding this phenomenon. Then I'll briefly talk about Mafa Kinch's operations and aims before moving on to an example demonstrating the organization's role in Moroccan contentious politics. So finally, I'll pose what I see as some key questions and conclude by discussing um, the future possibilities. So while Moroccan protests have come and gone, Mampa Kinch remains as the name adopted by an offshoot of M20 that developed into a powerful media organization. Modeled after the Tunisian website Nawat.org, which played a role in the country's Jasmine Revolution, Mampa Kinch defines itself as an activist citizen media portal composed of Moroccan militant bloggers um, that value democracy, liberty, um, respect for human rights, and right of access to information. Unlike Tunisia's revolutionary orientation, Morocco's protests were largely oriented towards further reform of the existing system, based on limiting the monarchy's political power while acknowledging its historical and cultural significance. In this moment, Mafa Kinch served several functions aimed at exerting pressure on authorities to accelerate reform. Compiling live, live coverage of um, protest events, circulating both reformist and revolutionary culture, distributing local news to both Moroccans and foreign media, and distributing foreign news coverage to Moroccans, all with the aim of making information accessible to average citizens. In less than a year, Mafa Kinch had more than one million unique visitors to its site, was attacked by pro-regime groups, and won the 2012 Google Global Voices Breaking Boundaries Award. What was initially a blog-based platform for aggregating information about protests and dispelling rumors about the M20 movement, eventually developed into a space for discussion and analysis that continued to aggregate content about M20 and social change in Morocco. Okay. So Mampa Kinch raised questions about the process of public formation and engagement with a new politics of culture, whereby a divided political sphere, the Arab Spring moment and its aftermath, 
and media affordances intervene in Morocco's long history of political repression. This agency in times of constraints has resulted in a new mode of cultural politics defined by the formation of flexible publics, which primarily exist around the periphery of political life and occasionally coalesce around specific claims in highly visible ways that cannot be ignored, both by a monarchy not accustomed to responding to its citizen subjects and a global society at large. These loosely networked pu publics employ symbols, discourses, and culture emerging out of the Arab Spring moment to make claims aimed at the monarchy and government and demand increased accountability from both. This contentious politics relies on collective action, yet the opportunities available for collective action are often defined by the political opportunity structure of a given society. So Morocco is classified as a high-capacity, undemocratic regime in that it ranks relatively low in Freedom House's scale of political rights and civil liberties. High-capacity regimes are likely to resist democratization because it entails power sharing and restrictions on the privileges enjoyed by those currently in power. For Morocco, MCs's rise to power and hopes for a transition to democracy have been frustrated by the regime's continuing authoritarian tendencies. Asif Bayat points out that for the MENA region in particular, political opportunity structures have been tied to the undermining of political authorities and mechanisms of control by, for instance, a political or economic crisis, international pressure, or infighting within ruling elites. Otherwise, in ordinary conditions, the authoritarian regimes in the region have expressed little tolerance towards sustained collective dissent. During the years of lead from about 1975 to 1990, M. Cease's father, Hassan II, responded to political opposition and attempts at democratization with violent repression that still lingers in the memories of many Moroccans. Thus, the opportunity structure produced by a fledgling civil society established during the first 10 years of M. Cease's reign, the unrest and high visibility of the Arab Spring moment, and disillusionment with the ideological arguments of established political parties produced organizations such as Mampa Kinj, which are part of a new engagement with the political in Maghrebi society. For Morocco, thinking about social change necessitates looking outside the realm of institutional politics to attempts to engage people in politics through culture and the process of public formation more broadly. Michael Warner describes publics as peculiar in that it is a space of discourse organized by discourse. So the creation of publics as sovereign spaces largely outside the authority of the state is shifting experiences and understandings of publicness and the political possibilities of engagement with culture and the symbolic. In The Wealth of Networks, Yokai Benkler argues that a new stage of the information economy is emerging that is defined by networks where the coordinate effects of the uncoordinated actions of a wide and diverse range of individuals and organizations acting on a wide range of motivations results in the peer production of knowledge, information, and culture. From its beginning, as an attempt to aggregate information and media reports about the Arab Spring protests to its shift toward critical analysis and operation as a cultural conduit, Mampa Kinch maintained that pure production of information and a culture of critique could challenge the status quo in a traditionally top-down political and media environment. The organization played a role in producing what I'm calling flexible publics, or groups with access to resources that allow them to assert claims in public and provocative ways. The concept connects closely with Aswan Panathan Bakar's mobile publics, um, which captures the role of mobile technology in the formation of these itinerant and frequently ephemeral um, groups. When particularly problematic issues arise, Mampa Kinch is capable of harnessing technological capabilities, social capital, and symbolic resources in order to coalesce around public conversations, resulting in a sort of activist in infrastructure that can be immobilized via its loosely connected network. So the collective was founded by two activists involved with other online initiatives who are a medical doctor and an engineer, respectively. At its height, approximately 30 bloggers in various locations comprised the Mampa Kinch Collective, although the public was invited to submit information and essays for publication. As time passed, a handful of activists came to form the core collective that was required to have a post-secondary degree. Operating through mailing lists, Google Docs, and occasional, occasional meetings or Skype sessions, the collective debated ideas for essays and articles, tr edited and translated articles from other sources, and located its site on a server in Switzerland. Many Mampa Kinch members have their own blogs or are involved in numerous other activist initiatives and say the site benefits from cross-posting across these platforms and publics. As Mampa Kinch attempts to, attempted to improve the legitimacy of the amorphous M20 movement and dispel rumors, one of its major challenges was verifying information. The site has been critiqued for publishing some reports that turned out to be false. For instance, that the northern city of El Hasima was surrounded by tanks during some of the protests. 
Despite these moments, Mampa Kinja's goal of creating an alternative media not dependent on advertising mm -hmm. and a movement that does not concede to the regime can be seen as an attempt to affect cultural change and turn um, M20 into a viable political alternative by producing flexible publics coalescing around issue-specific claims. So Mampa Kinch blogger Nizar believes that M M20 and Mampa Kinch emerged out of widespread disillusionment with the left in Morocco. When the socialists came to power in 2002 and 2007, they looked at the monarchy and said, it's too strong, so we'll have to work with it on the condition of respecting human rights in elections. The left had come to power in the collective imagination, but its collaboration with the traditional state apparatus and lack of progressive change left it without credible leadership, a clear political program, or electoral strength. So the failure of the left to institute meaningful change in Morocco led many, especially youth, to reject the ideology-based political parties and activism of their parents' generation and divided political sphere in general. For Mamfa Kinch blogger Zeynep, the refusal of older generations and those in power to incorporate youth and new ideas into existing structures has made youth a formidable force in opposition to a palace that's disconnected from reality, a blinded government that also happens to be deaf, and political parties whose main concern is to sabotage each other and get the majority while bowing down to the king's will at all times. The ability of the king to exert influence, particularly on the media, means that frequently the only story being told is that of the government elites, and youth tend to be shut out of participation in discourse. Mampa Kinch blogger, blogger Samia says that one mark of Mampa Kinch's success has been the greater media attention Morocco has received and continues to receive since protests began in February 2011. The most important thing is that international media organizations are not simply defaulting to statements produced by state media. The fact that our members are regularly getting interviewed suggests there's space and an interest to cover what the Moroccan regime doesn't want outsiders to know. Rallying cries such as Mampa Kinch that began as protest slogans have developed into symbolic capital defining not only the newfound right to protest, but also the, pu also the publics that engage in discourse around them, both on and offline, and a politics of culture in general. So what one notices in analyzing Mampa Kinch um, is the flurry of activity that pops up around certain issues and then dissipates when the issue is resolved or reaches a stalemate. Obviously, the Arab Spring received intense coverage on the site, but since then, it has acted as a sort of structuring mechanism and collection of cultural resources that remains in the background un until called upon to advance a particular claim. For example, on July 30th, 2013, MCs pardoned 48 Spanish prisoners at the request of the King of Spain, including convicted pedophile Daniel Galvin Vina. Galvin Vina, a Spanish citizen accused of raping 11 children, had been impr imprisoned in Morocco for 18 months as part of a 30-year prison sentence. So Morocco, Morocco's Idol Arche, or, or Feast of the Throne, traditionally involves the monarch pardoning prisoners of his choosing. However, news of Galvin Vina's pardon incited collective outrage manifest in massive protests and a media storm. Dubbed Daniel Gate um, by the Moroccan media, the events occurred two years after Arab Spring protests and led to reactivation of structures of dissent put into place during that moment. Ostensibly a decision made by the king himself, the, deci the decision spawned the hashtag Mafrazich, or I had no idea, in regard to MCs' first response to public outrage, which came five days after the pardon, um, claiming that he was unaware of the seriousness of Galvin Bainian's crimes. For six days after the pardon, Moroccan ma mainstream media observed a blackout on the topic. However, the story broke almost immediately via an independent online outlet and anger built on social media until foreign outlets began covering the protests. So the Daniel Gate hashtag became ground zero for anger at and even jokes about the king and his lack of oversight, despite government attempts to flood the conversation with bots. Moffat Kinch entered the conversation early, publicizing the pardon with a link to the Clum story on August 1st, and later announcing a sit-in scheduled in front of the parliament in Rabat. Live blogging of protest events, violence against participants, and analysis of the scandal continued even after the pardon was canceled on August 4th. Mampa Kinch's highly visible presence in the debates surrounding Daniel Gate culminated in the publication of an article calling for reform of the system of royal pardons. Thus, Morocco's history of suppressing dissent has made cultural spaces a key site of contention over political visions that are more recently intersecting with a newly networked and increasingly worldly youth digital culture. This is restructuring the norms of interaction between people in power, in that publics are increasingly accustomed to making demands of those in power and expecting a response. So we see here the first tweet um, from the Daniel Gate scandal from Mampa Kinch, so condemned to 30 years in prison, a Spanish pedophile is pardoned. 
And then at the bottom, um, a sit-in for an independent justice system and against the royal pardon of Daniel Galvin Vina, who raped 11 children. The question raised by using Mamfa Kinch as a lens to think about media and cultural politics in Morocco is how do organizations such as Mamfa Kinch produce and mobilize symbolic resources in attempts to bridge a divided and seemingly impenetrable public political sphere? Additionally, um, what happens to these publics and those newly incorporated into this politics of culture when the issues around which they coalesce become more mundane, fraught, and less straightforward? So my preliminary sense of the efficacy of organizations such as Mafa Kinch involves their ability to marshal both symbolic and technological resources in claiming a collective no. That is, producing publics capable of asserting themselves against the monarchy, authorities, and political parties accustomed to operating in a culture of impunity. The language surrounding so many of Mamfik Kinch's campaigns, as well as its own name, uses, uses Darija's negative form, um, through which members of these publics are encountering possibilities to resist power that was once taken for granted and in new and um, new ways. So the second question remains much more ambiguous, as cases such as Daniel Gate can clearly garner um, the support of broad publics, yet the everyday politics involved in governing are mu often much more contentious. So my preliminary sense is that for populations newly incorporated into these publics, what might be emerging as a, po a political agenda and set of values central to this new politics of culture. So in the case of Daniel Gate, that protect protecting society's most vulnerable is not arbitrary or open for debate. So Mamfa Kinch is just one site where independent media and a new politics of culture are emerging. In 2014, the movements and energy associated with the Arab Spring three years earlier have largely stagnated and left groups searching for um, future direction. This led Mamfa Kinch to take a hiatus earlier this year to reassess its direction and examine further quality control for the information published on its site. This hiatus now appears to be permanent as several key members of Mamfa Kinch have recently launched another initiative aimed at advancing digital rights in Morocco demonstrating the flexibility and creativity of these types of collectives and their publics. What began as an attempt to turn the Arab Spring moment in Morocco into a viable opposition capable of bridging a divided political sphere using media developed into a new mode of cultural politics defined by the formation of flexible publics and restructuring the norms of interaction between people and power. Thank you. So good afternoon, everyone. Uh, you probably realized that uh, I changed the title of my presentation, so it's different from the one that's in your program, because uh, it's a ongoing thinking process for me. Um, it is an empirical project. Uh, the data was collected like a, a year ago, but the, how you interpret her interpret the rich data um, it's it's the issue so I sort of um, been trying uh, to see what's the most fit um, concept or framework um, to, to sort of describe what I um, observe um, so articulating a nation state online um, it also sort of reflects the influence of the current affairs in the Middle East and in your part of Europe um, um, my thinking process. But anyway, um, so let me start with, oops. Okay. So, uh, start with a few words on the TDRI. Uh, I, it, it's been a, a great honor and a pleasure for me to be part of this research antipress. Um, so the goal of TBRI is to study the relationship between politics and the media. And the consensus among the colleagues who are um, on the teams of uh, this research project uh, seems to be um, sort of maybe not 
shifting from, but in addition to studying how social media mobilize individuals into collective and contentious actions from drastic changes um, to establish political orders, um, to exam examining the underlying historical and structural conditions to understand agents um, and practices by which everyday life is transformed into political action and mediating environments. So that you see um, our focus more on the uh, how we understand changes uh, through the lens of everyday life. Uh, of Speaking of change, since my case is in the context of Chinese society, um, in the time frame of uh, not much, not that much longer than three decades or so. The Chinese economy has developed into a full-blown market economy from the previously um, planned state um, managed and owned um, socialist type of economy and then accompanying this trend is the rapid urban, uh, urbanization uh, and as the ultimate manifestation of um, structural change would be the growing social inequality, um, social stratification in Chinese society. In addition, we also observe changes in um, media landscape, uh, media marketization, and uh, diffusion, rapid diffusion of uh, ICTs, especially the internet. So the media, um, in other words, have been not only the platform, um, not only served as the platform, but also one of the causes uh, and even the process by which these social changes happen um, or are happening. So um, how do we understand these changes? Uh, those of us who work in the new media uh, area or in Chinese communication probably would agree with me that um, civil society probably is one of the prominent frameworks uh, that has been frequently applied to explaining these changes. Um, so here, civil society uh, is both used to, um, as a universal program to uh, promote or channel some of the changes in a certain direction uh, as well as a uh, used as an analyt analytical framework to describe these changes. Um, I use the word universal uh, for its attempt to subsume the particular the pluralistic, uh, ephemeral, and mundane aspect of the everyday sphere. Um, so that's its effort or attempt. And some of the assumptions behind um, this framework do apply uh, some of the observation, empirical observations in China, for instance, instead of a completely, um, instead of completely subsumed by the totalitarian state, these days we um, have a sort of semi-autonomous society, uh, independent of the state, uh, instead of the object of political mobilization, we, we see um, examples of voluntary association uh, in, today's, um, in today's contemporary Chinese society. And similarly, autonomous, regional, rational individuals with equal rights in relation to the market that the assumption, um, the assumption of uh, the new subjectivity uh, developed <coughs> the new type of social actors in this um, social space called civil society, characterized as civil society. However, um, there are some caveats uh, to reduce this emerging social sphere um, to the idea of a civil society because some of the problems cannot be covered or explained clearly. For instance, well, the relationship between this emerging semi-autonomous uh, 
social region, uh, social sphere has a kind of a complex, complex uh, and intricate relationship with the market, which is created by the state. Uh, and similarly, um, similarly, it doesn't explain because of the assumption behind this equal abstract, um, uh, abstract individuals with equal rights, it sort of admits the internal dynamics within this social sphere. It doesn't talk much about um, social stratification or uh, socioeconomic relations among the social uh, actors active in this social sphere. And also, it doesn't talk that much about uh, relationship between this emerging civil society in, global, in the context of globalization. So, so nevertheless, uh, if you work within this framework, um, your, the criticism are directed towards, directed at, authoritarian state at the antithesis of civil society and um, nationalism uh, the official version of of nationalism um, uniformly associated with ethnocentrism parochialism anti progressism uh, progressivism uh, anti even anti westernism um, which understood this form of nationalism, it's understood as a political project uh, initiated and managed by the party state to fill the ideological void left by uh, the communist ideology. Um, but the difficulties of such criticisms have been um, the following uh, uh, could be uh, raised along these following um, lines of argument, um, although it may be true that it has been the it has been the political state, not a natural socioeconomic relation uh, relations of the community that gives form and voice of um, of the nation. Uh, however, uh, given the fact that the dealing king, this going ongoing dealing king of the um, state from society and the vice versa um, does make a new conception of the nation possible. Um, therefore, uh, we need to think twice about how to interpret the, uh, or how to attribute, or how to characterize this emerging social space. Um, and, and the possible new conception of the nation and, and its possible consequences um, for describing and analyzing China's economy, politics, and cultural life. So I pose these uh, questions as empirical questions, and so a good way for me to um, examine these empirical questions is through this uh, case study, uh, a mediated event that, uh, that happened and is still actually ongoing on the Chinese internet uh, especially on Sina Weibo. Um, it's about this century-old dispute, dis dispute between China and Japan over the uh, Diaoyi Islands in the East China Sea. Um, it was recently rekindled, rekindled um, by an um, attempt by the Japanese government to nationalize uh, the islands. Um, it sort of uh, evoked strong responses in China, especially online. The method is sort of to understand this mediated event as a node of articulation. Um, so you may um, be able to tell that uh, this concept of articulation is borrowed from cultural studies. Um, as, as, all, as other concepts of, uh, in cultural studies, um, it, is, it makes better sense when it applied to um, real empirical studies, but nevertheless, I'll give you the, a short, brief definition of it. It's a form of um, connection that unite different elements. A linkage, it's a type of linkage which is not necessary, determined, absolute, uh, or essential for all, time, uh, for all time, 
And it's really the articulation of a different, distinct elements, which can be re-articulated in different ways. So it's just this tempor temporary um, connection among different <coughs> parts. Um, but the goal is to uh, understand uh, Chinese social media as a symbolic space, uh, the discursive aspect of it, uh, and the social aspect of it, um, in addition to the technical instrumental of it, because the conventional way to understand the internet is to understand it as a technical platform used to uh, mobilize um, people or the public in events of activism. So it then tries to focus on the procedural uh, or processual uh, media media-oriented practices instead of the uh, spatial or uh, platform metaphor uh, oftentimes it's used by uh, researchers on this subject. Uh, so in other words, it's, uh, it's more of a uh, constructivist and an interpretivist approach um, that I try to um, follow for this project. Um, so the uh, um, when you see these two things together, the media and national imaginings, um, people are immediately reminded of um, Benedict Anderson's uh, Imagine Community, uh, Gunner Nations, uh, Gunner's work, Nations and Nationalism. So I guess I don't need to spend a lot of time explaining uh, to persuade you how important the media is in this project of imagining um, nations. Um, so. In context of the Chinese uh, media system, um, we've seen uh, the transition from a traditional media system that used to be part of part and parcel of these ide ideological um, apparatus of political communication controlled by um, the party state, and then we see the emergence of new social or commercial spaces for more liberal ideas in China, and then finally we arrived at a stage. Uh, where the internet seems to be the um, focus of the attention. So what kind of role does it play? Um, method is sort of uh, kind of a technical method that it would apply. We sort of borrow this um, computer program from computative linguists, used by computative linguists, and apply that computer to some 10,000 postings that we managed to um, got managed to get from Xilong Weibo uh, during that period of time. I think it's three months. Uh, all of them containing um, contain the word, the keyword that we got. In. So I, I will start spare you the um, technical details of how we did that. Um, so quickly, I'm not. I only have time to quickly summarize some of the uh, key findings. Um, so we do see uh, a lot of signs and, and patterns um, the, or evidence of a popular, the emergence of this popular nationalism. Uh, I, I wrote verses, but actually it has a very interesting and complex relationship with the official nationalism. Um, which the official na nationalism, um, which um, is bold or initiated, managed by um, the Communist Party based on the uh, traumatic um, experience of colonialism and imperialism. Um, so, um, state um, tries to um, be the embodiment of the nation. Um, translating national emotions into political terms, the state can command their political um, lo uh, people's political loyalty, um, and then this type of um, nationalism is more emotional, and then therefore it's beyond um, rationalization, and then uh, therefore it sort of um, uh, imposes obstacles to. Um, integration with uh, capitalism. So these are the um, dimensions that uh, describe the, sort of the official uh, version of nationalism. So for popular imagine, imaginings of uh, the nation, 
it's rich in volunteer impulses, and it usually um, it's talked about in socioeconomic terms. For instance, people would talk about what if we get the island back, and, and they belong to the lake state, not us. Um, so stop fussing, things like that. So in the kind of um, socioeconomic terms, people think about these things. And then also, we also, we also I have examples later, hopefully I'll get to that, um, the emergence of this individual and civic liberty in um, terms along these lines of argument. Um, so how, the, these popular impulses uh, also uh, structured by and, and it, by historical memories and informed by contemporary grievances. Um, and the, so China has a long history, so it provides a lot of res uh, resources for people uh, to imagine what a nation is um, in relation to the um, changes in contemporary environment. But the key is to how to understand the changing nature and role of the Chinese state in um, this national imagining. Um, at this current stage, uh, it's more of a um, neo-authoritarian bureaucracy who uh, successfully um, saved uh, the economic uh, liberalization. Um, and because of its role, the state uh, for instance, the biggest shareholder, uh, stakeholder, employer, controller of the infrastructure. So it's 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 oddly present, and it's a part of it. It has to be the part of the, uh, or even the center of the new image of the nation. Um, and in relation to this uh, new phase of, of the nation or the new uh, state, uh, people develop new subjectivity. So social actors are uh, getting new sub uh, subjectivity uh, based on individuality, economic rationalism, so liberty and so on and so forth. For example, would be uh, city inspectors. Um, it's an official agency in and installed in cities across China to tackle low level um, local, low level crime. And it has become a symbol of abusive and administrative administrative power. Um, but if you think it um, carefully, in fact, the objects of such a power, such a, an administrative power, are uh, most often rural migrant workers working in the cities or the urban poor um, living in the cities. The island pop population, mostly a middle um, stratum, mostly belong to a middle stratum, not at all innocent in the explosive social relationship. Um, they sort of appropriate this profound social economic subject and turn it into an issue of civic right, which is more relevant to them. Um, and then similarly, these rash uh, as the boycotts and the accompanying street protests in some places became violent and out of control. Many users began to voice a strong disapproval and deep anxiety over um, how things are going. So this ideal of rational patriotism. Um, emerged as a strategy to, to strike a compromise between protecting private um, material ownership and, and loyalty to, uh, to the nation. And so rational patriots as um, rational consumers, that sort of thing. So, and the third theme would be um, the, the nation state in the context of globalization. Um, the integration of the Chinese economy, oops, sorry. With global market, has had multiple effects on Chinese um, social life. On the one hand, it had exposed Chinese market uh, in the realm of daily life to global capital and to international fashion and ideologies. But on the other hand, China's entry into the world, uh, into the world market, also has enabled Chinese consumers to encounter a world of difference, often delineated in terms of nation state, um, uh, delineated in terms of nation state. Um, within nation state borders. And so in this world, Chinese are reminded of their location in and belonging to a particular community identified by geography, economy, language, politics, uh, common history and culture and so on and so forth. Um, so I, I think I have two more slides left. So again, I hope I have more time, but uh, these real-time reaction, real-time reactions and actions of the 
we were users are not only responsive to but also constitutively unfolding events in the dispute uh, in the dispute and to connect the particular um, pluralistic ephemeral and mundane aspect of everyday life uh, are sort of organized by ongoing events on Sina Weibo and such an articulation mediates the understanding um, of social economic relationships and domestic and, and abroad. I hope I sort of managed to get these, idea, uh, these ideas across. So as a conclusion, um, nationalism as a new way of, um, it's, it's a new way um, for Chinese to imagine a nation and formulate its culture under new socioeconomic and cultural circumstances um, so there is no more state mo mo um, monopoly to the national ima imaginings. Um, so the mass cultural reinvention of the nation is broader and much much more complicated. Um, but what we'll skip over the how do we understand this uh, open-ended social field? Um, should it be Mediated like normal, normatively, we could think that uh, such a um, social sphere could be mediated by citizenship, um, as promoted by some activists or um, scholars on the right, uh, or a liberal um, school of uh, camp of scholars, or the people, as some left-leaning scholars hoped, or the state. Um, we need to think of uh, these questions carefully, because otherwise, without this political characterization, um, it sort of deprives the nation of the political foundation uh, in popular participation and deprives the material well-being and personal freedom of their social <coughs> Um And then lastly, um, to the extent that popular um, culture mediates online, mediates new media of the nation state and social, uh, and their international relationships, it's sort of provides both the means and substance of the mediated popular activism in China. So that's uh, the end of my um, presentation. Okay, perhaps we can get our speakers back up here. And um, on behalf of all of us, I thank you for a rich and thoughtful group of papers here. And I uh, want to open it up for questions, but briefly say only that all of these papers um, seem to be wrestling with the question of how do we frame and conceptualize uh, digital civil society. And so one question uh, is, what kind of a space is do we have for protest, and how can we think about what might be the commonalities between physical spaces for protest and virtual spaces for protest? And then what are the special capacities and affordances of uh, digital protest um, that is in some way removed from physical protest, though though connected to it, what, what are the special capacities of that, um, of that digital ability to stand outside the physical sphere? And finally, what framework allows us to um, understand the operators between the, the digital and the physical? And in the case of Sina Webo in particular, uh, what kind of popular imagination in terms of imagined communities of what the nation is, how is that being reimagined in a digital discussion? So let's open it up and see what folks have to, to say. Yeah. Um, yeah, thanks for this. Um, I, I have a question to um, Anne-Marie and um, Bayal. <clears throat> like to Anne-Marie, the notion of, of um, flexible publics, um, like as a theoretical intervention, like what, what my question is, what would then be an unflexible public in, in that sense? Because um, like it seems to me what like what um, you're saying is that in authoritarian contexts, civil society or activists have to be more flexible than maybe democratic um, contexts. Um, but I wonder if, if that is best captured by the idea of, of flexibility 
since you know publics are always relational and therefore by definition kind of flexible um, and like to pair you know the um, like the metaphor of um, like the, the parks and particularly um, speakers corner um, I wonder if you could elaborate on um, like how kind of the history of speakers corner as a metaphor in the UK and how now it's become like this tourist site where seemingly crazy people, you know, like talk and, and nobody stops them. And it's become like the san sanctioned space of like, of, you know, uh, I don't know what, what the word that I'm looking for, but this performance of, of, um, of activism that is really like devoid of, of any substance in that, in a way. So does that, like, can we push that metaphor? How do you think can we push it in relation to, to digital media and is it helpful? Okay, so I guess I'll go first. Um, so this notion of flexible publics that I'm working with, um, it's fairly new, so I'll say that, so I'm still kind of playing around with it. But um, basically it was sort of in response to um, these notions of the public sphere that kind of um, have often addressed citizens as a, as a whole. Um, and also publics are always relational, however the um, the, the tools in which they're using in these like mobilizing capacities, I think, have, have changed the way that they're operating. Um, my, my sense is that, um, that there's a really, um, just the, the speed with, with which with things are changing um, and the, with which issues come up and then vanish from the agenda. That was sort of the, the idea that I was trying to capture with that. Um, this ability to adjust to the situation, to um, come back with a response once the regime, um, you know, responds or something like that. So it was really this sort of back and forth dynamic that had been not um, particularly present in the case I was looking at um, previous to that. So um, as I said, it's still a little um, ambiguous at this point, but yeah, that's something that um, I was trying to point out. Um, it's a very good point, and I think um, I think to begin with, we need to disassociate uh, a symbolic space from material space. And um, so, as a symbolic, uh, as a material space, the speaker's corner, in some sense, has lost its, you know, um, authenticity of protest. But actually, I would say that a lot of this, like for example, People's Park you know, where, uh, 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 you know, speakers corner, a number of these spaces have become icons of tourism, and this is where the market mechanism comes in, right? And it gets usurped by the market. And we see this also in the digital sphere that what is initially authentic as a, you know, even think about couch surfing, there's a particular ideology it starts with, and slowly it becomes usurped, and then it gets marketized, and it loses potency, but somewhere else, another of its kind or you know, the templates of architecture come up, uh, which allows it to become, you know, authentic again. But um, so that is definitely, I think we don't pay enough attention to how the market usurps these very architectures of openness as, you know, and, um, uh, and the very potency because there's so much creativity invested in, uh, you know, making these um, uh, ideologies uh, relate to a very diverse multitude of people. So that itself is a brilliant marketing, which of course the private sector will usurp. Uh, and so that's something we should really examine more and put the market more in our conversation. And, and I do that in the book. Um, but as far as uh, authenticity, I would actually hesitate to say that it lacks authenticity when it circulates to other contexts because it is the social action that gives uh, symbol authenticity. It's not the actual you know, symbolism that gives the action authenticity. So I would say it's, that's, that's how I would approach that. Um, I would like to follow up on that just for a second. When you were talking before, I like this idea about protest in a creative way. Um, the park is a as a space where, as you speak, you know, you talk about it as an architecture that that exists already in space, and people come into it. But I kept thinking about Occupy and thinking about the way in which the the, the notion of this 
architecture of space, this possibility of protest, could be playful, could maybe isn't uh, often, that is taken out of the park and then goes elsewhere. So this idea about sort of this mobility or flexibility, the notion of the of parkness as a, a space of protest being taken out. I mean, especially with the camp, you know, camping and tents. You think about Zuccotti Park, that was sort of like archetypal, but there were all sorts of you know, it was like whack-a-mole, you know, their tents would pop up here and then they get they 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 get repressed and then pop up somewhere else. It's the notion of the park as a place of protest and creative play that gets taken out of the park and, and sort of pops up elsewhere. I guess it's more of a comment than a question. It's this way you're what you're yeah, but I, I really like that. It's like the park It's there's a park and then there's a parkness, a phenomena, right? And the urban park here in my, my book actually serves as a metaphor. And so it actually is a very, and Zuccotti is a great example because talk about market mechanism that is owned by the private sector, right? And yet it is considered a public space. So perception carves out what that space is meant to be, even though you have regulations across parks where you have to register if you want to protest, but people dismiss that. So there are the institutional rules, there are private mechanisms, and then there's actual practice. And it's interesting to see because the relations. space is all, never fully public. It's always right. presumptively public, exactly. you know. And the question is, what is the set of rules that's kicking into motion this particular space? Mm -hmm. And in the case of, I mean, I think it's really interesting in that respect to talk about these originally royal parks with their, you know, the the person was there in Speaker's Corner because the state was about to kill him. So the, you know, the, the I mean, authentic it may be, but in a very funny That's kind of true. way, you know. And, and so those rules were established in that kind of aristocratic ideal mm -hmm. that this is a, that the park has always been a heterotopic space. It's different from the the public square. Now they merge into each other and you know the protesters don't necessarily respect the difference but in fact the protesters are most often in the streets and then most often in the square and so it's really interesting about the protesters being in the park although in the case of People's Park that's a funny kind of a little park you know it isn't really like Central Park uh, where there's been relatively little protest uh, because of these kinds of, of, of rules and I would say, in terms of a garden and the park as a place of regulation, I mean, the oldest one we know about, you know, is the Garden of Eden. And there were a lot of rules. <laughs> 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 so, very presumptive. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so, so the market is the same thing. It's a presumptive public space. So we're always pushing back against, you know, the permission, wherever that comes from. Yeah. Actually, I wanted to pick up on the question of the park and the garden. So mm -hmm. I'm so glad you brought it up and the presumption of publicness is very, uh, very provocative set of papers. And your book pile is on my reading list. So maybe you've covered this in the, in the book. But I was really wondering about the difference between the park and the garden. Because I see uh, the garden as a very structured, aestheticized space you know, matter out of place, much less democratic space. I, I'm just riffing here. And in Occupy, when the protesters were encroaching, somehow they were, the aesthetics wasn't right, right? So they're, mm -hmm. they're, they're ruining the place. Mm -hmm. And the reason I bring this up is also because the garden has a post-colonial genealogy. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know, maybe you're the parts expert, you, you know. That's so scary, yeah. but that's true at this point. <laughs> that, <kind of> scary. <laughs> that the Mughal garden, I mean, I've heard it said in India oh. that the, the French robbed the Mughal idea of a garden, you know, the, verse, the garden in Versailles is really the Mughal garden. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and so, but the garden is no longer associated with the global south because it's mm -hmm. no privileged sort of aesthetic space. So I was just wondering if uh, no, the a, garden as a sort of way yeah. of weeding out might be something to look at. Yeah, I've, I've written an entire chapter called Walled Gardens, which is also not a, <laughs> in the book. So it's not a coincidence, by the way, that that no, but the, that term is very much used in IT sphere as the walled gardens of Apple, the iTunes, you know. And so it's, again, not a coincidence that term has been usurped in the IT sphere. And the garden is actually um, a very rich, when we talk about the garden, there's a lot of rich literature about the Mughals. I put that in the book about the India. And during the colonial times, the British 
created the British Garden in India, but they felt very uncomfortable because they felt the servants were constantly gazing at them. So it was sort of reverse gazing. And they even wrote in notes, uh, like the women of the house said, we feel very uncomfortable in our Britishness because we feel the Indianness is intruding into our garden space. So, but they felt it was much more of a public statement of their Britishness coming to India, but at the same time, it was more private then, and they wanted that privacy, but they weren't given that because of the servants all around the place. And it, it's a very interesting, and I compare that with the same kind of understandings of how, uh, you know, the backroom IT people in India are uh, like shaping the gardens of uh, technology architecture. And, you know, they're gazing at the Western data and they can manipulate it. And so in a sense, it's a talk about you know, in some sense, people are like, oh, it's so subjugated. You know, the India, the back offices, on the other hand, they have this tremendous power over massive amounts of data. And they have, of course, used that time and again, as if you've got any spam from Indian, <laughs> you know, uh, you know, Indian sites, you'll know that you're on their radar. But yeah, there's a very rich, there's also gardens of like, and feminism. Gardens have been equated with feminism. I can go all into that, but there's not so. But it's it's a very important distinguishing factor between gardens and parks and the politics that in the end it's about symbolic spaces which are semi-private. Let me ask you since I haven't read your book and I'm really looking forward to it um, <laughs> from this discussion. The park is a kind of given space. I mean people are allowed or permitted to come into it and certain behavioral standards are expected from them and they can be evicted if they are not met. Mm -hmm. But isn't a garden also about cultivation? I mean, a garden is the was originally the kitchen garden that just sat. It, the peasant had a kitchen garden, and you know this was a very it was a very homely place that homely literally where food was produced and all the rest of it. So there's an engagement with the the garden in a way that now there's royal gardens and that's different. They're more like the parks that I'm describing here. But isn't there a sense of the garden that is cultivated? So in a sense, your, your metaphor about the IT folks is very much a gardening metaphor because mm -hmm. they're there, you know, tilling the soil of digital life. Yeah. I mean, I, mean, I, I, I love the, the looking at the urban parks because if you look at the evolution of it, it has, you know, spiraled into corporate parks. So how corporations are usurping these leisure, uh, you know, um, uh, areas and architectures, and they're not public, and yet they are, right? So they're public for the employees, and yet they're very privatized. So you have the entire area on corporate parks, and you have wall gardens, which are, in fact, in Gramercy Park to date in New York, you need a key to get in. And there's a history in the 1800s, it was only for elite to access it, and it continues to this day. It's a uh, New York Times just recently called it the Victorian gentleman that refuses to die. So, you know, it's, uh, it's a cross board. But I try to stay uh, less, uh, uh, I, I try to focus more on the urban park because of this very concerted action by the authority to demarcate a space for public use and the complications that arise with its privatization, commercialization, but, and popularization, and less on the sort of private holdings. However, if we see what's happening with the internet today, you know, less and less people, in fact, a, a recent article in the New Yorker said, Facebook, you know, is, should be left to the riffraff, you know, and really we need to get more into private spaces. And so, because that's where there is no such thing as a, you know, monolithic community. Communities are built on discrimination. So you need to carve out, and gardens are private, semi-private spaces with selected, you know, members for participation. And that's what's also happening to a great extent on the internet is like-minded individuals are carving spaces for themselves and walling themselves in, getting very no neighbor, local centric like look at the site next door for example and we can go on but yeah that i think is a reflective trend so there's a lot to be learned about the history and the evolution of our urban studies urban planning park studies and we can literally see to me i think we can see how the internet's also moving and uh, yeah so since they've already why reinvent the wheel right so uh and guess what you'll give them life you know the park studies will come back with vigor, they'll hire more academics, maybe. <laughs> so, 
So hopefully not me because I plan to, yeah, clear this all out of my mind. <laughs> so. question for all three of you. I think it was Anne-Marie who uh, brought up the notion of accountability, which I think is very important. Um, and, but uh, all of you are, are dealing with civil society as a potentially uh, opened up space by which government or corporations or police departments are made accountable to the people, to the public. Um, and digital civil society, you know, makes uh, seems to offer a lot of new potential for that, and the visibility, the symbols created by protest, um, create the visibility that is a prerequisite for accountability. But it seems to me that in a lot of ways, um, as an accountability mechanism, uh, that's dubiously effective. And in some ways, you know, governments have become much less accountable to the people. Do you think that there is a missing link there? And do you think that perhaps the way that urban spaces are policed um, might provide that link uh, as a sort of, uh, to say that um, this is a means by which uh, dominant interests can limit the effectiveness of protest as a means of creating accountability? So I guess I'll start. Um, so my sense is that um, in terms of accountability, I mean, speaking about the Moroccan case specifically, there's been just very generally a lack of ability to address those in power at all, right? And so um, you see in the Arab Spring, the major day of protests, February 20th, um, didn't get a response from the from those in power, from the monarchy, until March 9th, right? And even then, they didn't directly respond to the claims of the protesters or even talk about the protesters. They were just like, oh, and we're going to have a constitutional referendum. Um, so this sort of very, um, you know, dancing around the relationship between um, power and the people has happened for a long time. And so in Morocco, I think the approach that Mamfa Kinch in particular has taken and other groups as well, um, this has been talked about as sort of the boomerang effect, I guess, is to sort of create these high visibility um, campaigns and to coalesce around these specific issues um, so that you garner international support and particularly that of other um, civil society groups or um, activist organizations. And they, in turn, um, will play place pressure on other governments to sort of um, rein in the home government, right? So Morocco has all sort of aspirations um, with European trading partners and developmental initiatives and these sort of things. And so that has been sort of one of the strategies in play um, in terms of uh, getting accountability um, through digital media that, that has played a role. Uh, okay. um, I guess the, if you, Put the accountability in, uh, full, into the back to the full question would be who should be held responsible for what on whose behalf? Uh, I'm not. I guess I, I'm not sure if I expressed uh, myself cl clearly in my during my presentation. I'm not that committed to the idea of civil society, at least as a theoretical and um, framework to explain what I observed online. Uh, I guess there are many different ways to uh, characterize um, who is being exploited, who is on the margin, uh, on the peripheral versus who is in the center. So there, there are um, uh, rural versus urban, there is middle class versus working poor, and, and there is um, uh, as a still as a developing though rising, but still as a developing world um, society versus the van more advanced societies in a global context, there are many different ways to um, characterize different parties. Therefore, the accountability may mean um, totally different things. Um, I don't want it to be whenever accountability is brought up, it always means the evil authoritarian government versus the uh, the civil society. That's not always the best way to characterize um, the many different uh, or the dynamics in Chinese society. Does that make sense? Uh, or to tie back to uh, 
one of the presentations this morning is that uh, when the rape happened, um, the reason that it was the victim was a middle class woman, and that it became uh, the center of attention for the whole nation versus all previous nameless victims that maybe probably were ignored because they're they belong to a um, more marginal um, groups, uh, things like that. So I don't know if that. And actually, the thing with accountability is that much of the literature out there has a positive connotation. I actually think that accountability is one of the most powerful instruments to rationalize surveillance architectures because it allows you to justify big data usage because for your own good. It allows you to say that these, we are tracking you on a constant level for your own good. So accountability has been really instrumentalized very powerfully today. And uh, one of the key elements, I would say, in designing these architectures of protection, um, which, are, which is problematic, but it continues to hold that positive connotation, which allows a, you know, a certain cachet. And that's something I think is worth examining. I just have a quick comment, because I know we're out of time. Um, but uh, in response to that, I think that accountability, I agree with you uh, with, with what you just said about accountability and, and how it gets usurped as, uh, appropriated as a kind of um, means of justifying control. Um, but I think there are also struggles over language that shouldn't be, uh, you shouldn't surrender um, that, uh, to that kind of appropriation. Um, and I'm thinking about the practice of the politics of shame um, that uh, Anne-Marie is uh, sort of alluding to in, in her uh, project, where um, accountability is brought to bear against a repressive uh, regime um, by appealing to, by, by deploying the politics of shame and bringing external pressures onto um, so it, it's 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 both ways. It's uh, yeah. You can't you can't say that that's no longer our property. Yeah, you know, that's no longer the people's property. Uh, the um, the mechanisms of accountability. It's it's it has to be an ongoing struggle over over um, what that means. I wonder if there's a technological point to be made about accountability from a historical point of view, and this is very exploratory, but at the end of the 19th century, when there was great concern about the mob, the people who were protesting in the streets with their bodies, you know, part of the, the rationale and part of the support for the emergence of the public, the democratic public of the kind that Habermas likes to talk about, right, was that you could offer an opinion and the mob couldn't get you because you were behind a closed door. You had written it, you know, there's delays and all this kind of stuff. So the people who were um, being critical were protected from mob retaliation in, in a general sense. And I think what's interesting about some of the, the stuff, and Maka Pinch seems to me to be this, and, and, and uh, Sandoebo and stuff, but I'm, you know, probably wrong, but let me put it out there, okay? Which is that the protection here is from the state. So you're not being protected from the mob in the street. You're being a little more protected from the government because you're, you're, in, a you're in a virtual shield. And they can still find you in all kinds of ways. But it is an automatic, and you have these kinds of escape routes and things like that. So... In terms of where the account, how the accountability operates, it seems to me that one thing that's distinctive about the internet and and protest that goes digital is that it's the state you're shielded from. Whereas in the original introduction of print, it was in fact the people that you were shielded from by exercising that new technology. But I'm sure that's wrong. <laughs> <laughs> it makes a good answer. Anybody else? I, I just wanted to ask Kyle a, a bit about the use of the term leisure in your title. You know, all that we've talked about is really about control and openness, about sort of the interesting vocabulary of the use of the internet. But you seem to emphasize leisure as a really important thing, and I didn't get that through the talk of the question, so I thought you could just say a word about that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, considering the whole book is. <laughs> it's like, I mean, yeah, I mean, the, 
you know, urban parks, the, the rationale given for urban parks was it was primarily oriented towards leisure, right? So that's what the state demarcated as this public space is for leisure of the masses. It was from socialization, uh, socializing of the masses. And so I start off with that as the grounds is because leisure is, th there is no other purpose. It's not an instrumentalized space. It is very open, it's nebulous, it's hard to pinpoint what you're doing because each person's leisure is very different. But these are sort of unregulated behaviors which are very personal, but is not very, yeah, it doesn't have an instrumental value, utilitarian value. So that that having even the, the even conceptualizing that you need a space like that is rather impressive for the 19th century, I would say, and for society at large. And so that is really the foundation of the urban park and the bases. But same thing with the internet is that we, uh, or actually forget the internet, every new media, the television, the look at the radio, just from the, I've done research on just India, and every time you come with a new technology, you try very hard to make it utilitarian. You know, uh, they had used the radio during po the colonial times, and they would uh, like uh, spread educational information to rural villages in India. And over time, it got usurped by entertainment, social purposes. So it, it's fundamentally used for that. Television, the same thing. They try to do education and X, Y, Z across the world. You know, so why did we think that the internet would be different? But yet that same rhetoric gets used at the birthing of every new technology. And we've seen that in the internet. And so I'm bringing it back to, you know, saying let's look at it as a leisure, a geography of leisure, but also it's very important because even methodologically, then you recognize where your starting point is because you need to have a sort of contextual base to have your dialogue and your critique. And if you're not recognizing that it is a geography of leisure and from within that is embedded politics or embedded corporatization or embedded all these other elements, I think then you are getting somewhere. So it's very important to know where that starting point is. And so that is the starting point. I'm. If you want to ask another question, I mean, go ahead. <laughs> All right. Okay. So we're done. Thank you very much for your attention. Thanks to our excellent panelists. I really.